Well, the first question, it says residents of a small city voted on whether to allow a developer to build a shopping center. The number of votes in favor of the shopping center was 4,400. The number of votes against the shopping center was 17,600. What percent of the voters were in favor of building the shopping center? So, this definitely was a few part question. First of all, you need to know that concept of part over whole equals percent out of 100. And you needed to find the part that were in favor. So uh, if you look at those numbers, there's definitely less people that wanted this thing, to, this shopping center to be built than people who were against it. Many people were against it, right? So our percentage should be pretty low. Um, you know, just kind of looking at those numbers, you probably could have eliminated C and D immediately because that's pretty darn close to 50%. And you can see that um, 4,000 is not, you know, 50% of, you know, 17,000. You know, I know I'm doing some rounding there, but you know, common sense should tell you that those are probably not our answer, but we're gonna do the math to be sure. So, um, part over whole equals percent over 100. So we're focusing on the percent that we're in favor. So we're going to say the part we're using is 4,400. So you can see that in that box that I have, um, you know, in a square there, that is a part over the total number. Now, where did I get the total number? Well, if we know the part that voted for it and we know the part that voted against it, you know, the whole amount is a sum of its parts. So we've got to add those two numbers together to figure out how many total people were voting. And when you add that, you're going to get 22,000 people voting. All right, so we're going to try to figure out what if that were out of 100? That's going to give us our percent, okay? So we're scaling 22,000 down to 100, and we do that by dividing by 220, right? So if you take 4,400 divided by 220, you're gonna get 20 out of 100. That's a one, one out of five. We're not in favor of this. So um, that is choice A, 20%. They love 20% questions, I'm just gonna say that. All right, let's go over the next one. 31, the answer is choice C. This one is a simple um, proportion, finding part of the whole. And it says, Miss Perrin's class, 75% uh, of the students are boys. There are 18 boys in the class. What is the total number of students in Miss Perrin's class? So again, part over whole equals percent out of 100. So we know that the boys represent uh, three fourths, right? 75% of the group. So that's where this um, number on the right of the screen, 75 over 100, simplified down to three out of four is coming from. And that top number represents the boys. So we know that 18 is the number of boys, so we put that across from the 75% that also represents boys. And then the bottom number is the whole amount, so we put that across from the 100, and that's what our missing piece was. When you go from 3 to 18, you got to multiply by 6. So 4 times 6 is 24 total kids, and that's how we got choice C. Now, what I have in the middle here is... Um, a more complicated way to do it, so I'm going to erase this. But essentially what that was showing is if you want to find out, you know, 25% are girls, right? So you have to figure out how many girls there are, and then you could, um, but it's complicated. Ignore that way, okay? That's all I'm going to say about that. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, 32, a scientist studied the migration patterns of two types of whales. We have the humpback whale who travels 2,240 miles in 28 days and the gray whale that traveled 2,368 miles in 32 days. So if the humpback whale had traveled at the same rate for 32 days, how many more miles would they have traveled than the gray whale? So essentially what we're doing is we're finding how many miles each whale can travel in a day first, that's our first step, what's their rate, what's their speed, and then we're going to scale it up to 32 days so that they're traveling the same amount of time, and then we're going to find the distance um, and subtract how far one is from the other, essentially, okay, so it's kind of three steps, so the first step is to figure out how far they travel per day, so I have the work for the humpback whale here on the left-hand side of the screen, and that was 2,240 miles, and that's over the course of 28 days. When you divide those two quantities, that's gonna give you how many miles per day when you put your miles on top and the days on the bottom. It's 80 miles per day, right? So with the gray whale, if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, I do the same process. 2,368 miles over the course of 32 days. That means that guy is traveling 74 miles per day. 
all right? So obviously, the humpback whale is a little faster than this gray whale. Uh, so now what we need to do, so that was step one. Step two is figure out how far do they travel in 32 days. Well, we can do that by taking the number we found for each day, scaling it up to 32 days. So that's where I'm coming up with 2,560 on the left. And on the right, that scales up to 2,368 miles for the gray whale. But we still have one more step, which is simply to find out how much further that humpback whale is going than the gray whale. And we do subtraction. That's going to give you a difference of 192 days, or not days, miles, um, over the course of 32 days. It's going 192 miles further than the other guy. All right. Um, hopefully you did all right on that one. Let's move on to the next question. Um, the next series of questions are what we call part two questions. Part two questions you always get a calculator for, so yay. Um, and you know my rule of calculators. If you plan on typing it into the calculator, you should have your setup shown so that um, there's no question what you did to get whatever number you're going to be writing down. You need to show and label all of your work because that work will count for partial credit. So, um, you know, even if you end up getting the wrong answer, if you have the work down and you made some calculation error or something, you still might be able to salvage a lot of points on that. So, definitely show your work. You never put question marks and write, I don't know, or anything like that. You should always be attempting these. Um, and I think, you know, they're doable, but again, multiple steps. All right, so you gotta kind of create a plan. How am I gonna get to where I need to be? So the first question that you had for this was, um, you know, a lot about percentages. And it's talking about events happening in Rochester. And the first one is the Amherst, I'm not sure I said, had a hockey playoff game on Friday. The Blue Cross Arena has 13,000 seats. That's the total number of seats right there. That should have been underlined. And it says tickets, for 78% of the total number of seats were sold. So they had a good turnout here, okay? 78% of the seats are sold. How many tickets were sold? So we're gonna convert, um, you know, this from a percent into a number of tickets. So um, ignore part B for right now. Let's look at uh, the green writing at the top here. And I have the sold part over the whole or total equals our percent out of 100. So I'm going to plug in our numbers from the problem. So 13,000 was our total number of seats. That's why I put that across from 100 because that's 100% of the seats. Now 78 was the other percent we were given and those were indeed sold tickets. So that across from that we're going to find the number of tickets. You know, we know the percentage of tickets, 78% that are sold, but we want to correlate that to number of tickets. So to do that, we've got to look for the connection between 100 and 13,000. So you've got to multiply 100 by 130 to get 13,000. So if you do the same thing to 78, you're going to get 10,140 tickets. So that's a good good amount of tickets, right? 78% is pretty close to 80%. It should be most of the tickets sold. So that, that seems like a reasonable answer. So to the right, in the blue box, it says 10,140 sold seats. All right. And again, you'll notice with part two, the numbers are a little bit bigger um, because you're given a calculator. No excuse for getting that math wrong. You can plug it right into a calculator. All right. Part B. Um, this says the auditorium center has 3,900 seats and tickets are sold for 3,276 of the seats. So again, good turnout, right? We've got that seems like a pretty high percentage, right? If you've got almost all the seats sold. Um, so people are going to watch Lily Miz, and it says, what percent of the seats were, were tickets sold? So we're finding the percent sold, essentially. So that should have been underlined. What percent of the tickets are sold? Okay, so again, set up the same. You're going to have um, the part that were sold over the total number possible that could have sold, right? So part over whole. The whole amount goes across from 100, so 3,900 is across from 100. To get from 3,900 to 100, you've got to divide by 39. Now that's the same thing you got to do to the top. 3,276 divided by 39 is going to give you 84% or 84 out of 100. So 84% of the seats in the um, auditorium 
center were sold. Okay, now another way that you can do this, this particular problem, if you're given part over whole, you can uh, do division here. So let me clear this out from another problem. If we take 3,276 and we divide that by 3,900, you're going to notice we're going to get 0.84. That's the decimal version of our answer. So we want to turn it into a percent. So you can move that decimal place two to the right. That's 84% of the ticket. So you could have done it that way through division as well. That would work really well for part B. All right, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. I know I'm going quickly through these, but honestly, um, Hopefully it's just kind of tweaking some things. All right, the next um, question is about Sebastian, right? I didn't skip one, did I? Nope. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, Sebastian, now it's funny. They picked, you know, the guy from Little Mermaid. Is he the lobster? Yeah, he's the lobster, right? The lobster, Sebastian, swimming laps. Come on, guys. Um, he swam laps every day in the communities swimming pool he swam 45 minutes each day go Sebastian five days each week for 12 weeks so he's spending a lot of time swimming in that time he swam 1,800 laps what is that is his average rate in laps per hour so we want to figure out how fast is this guy going if he got eight 1,800 or 1,800 laps in in this amount of time so first of all we're going to figure out how long did that take the guy so we're going to take 45 times 5 that's going to give you 200 and again, you can use a calculator for this. Now, if you have 225 um, minutes, that was for the week, but he's doing that for 12 weeks, so we got to multiply that as well. That's where we get 2,700 minutes. Okay, but we want to figure out laps per hour. So we, instead of saying minutes, we've got to convert our minutes to hours. Well, we know there are 60 minutes in every hour, so you're going to take 2,700 minutes and divide it by 60. That's going to tell us how many hours. When you do that, you can see the work over here on um, the right-hand side for this. You're going to get 45 hours, which is a lot of time. But this is over the course of 12 weeks, so that's you know three months worth of um, doing this. So 45 hours is what we spent. But that's not the end of this problem because we want to figure out how fast is he going like what how many is how many laps is he able to get done in in one hour so if he had 1800 laps and he took 45 hours to do that you divide those two numbers you're going to get 40 laps for every one hour okay so again you've got multiple steps step one find the amount of time he spent in the pool step two convert that to hours step three take um, the laps that you were given 1,800 divided by the number of hours and that's going to give you how many laps he can do in one hour okay so again none of those steps are difficult but you do have to do a few of them to get to the right answer so the next question we're going to go over is 35 Darnell's car all right this one was a challenging question it says Darnell's car used eight gallons of gas to travel 340 miles after a mechanic worked on the car, it used seven gallons of gas to travel 350 miles. If the price of gas was approximately $4 per gallon, how much less, it should say to the nearest cent per mile, did it cost to run the car after the mechanic worked on it? So, let's figure out what the gas mileage was before he got the car fixed. Okay, I'm assuming it got better. We would hope after it was fixed. So, you can see that work uh, right below the problem here before. If we take 340 miles and that was you know shared equally amongst eight gallons of gas that means every um, gallon was getting 42 and a half miles all right so 42.5 miles per gallon before it got fixed now that's that's really good but it got better right because after got at the bottom of the screen he went uh, Darnell went 350 miles and that took him seven gallons of gas. That means that every 50 miles he used a gallon of gas. Okay, so our next step is to figure out how much did each mile cost Darnell. Okay, so at the first rate before he got his car fixed, if we want to find out the price per mile, we've got to take our, our price and divide it by the number of miles. So in this case, $4 would 
take you 42 and a half miles. When you divide those, you're going to get um, 0 0.094 and it's going to go on. But we're going to round it up to the nearest whole cent. So that would be $0.09 for every mile. It's costing him pretty close to a dime every time he drives a mile. After he got it fixed, we're going to do the same process. We want to find the price per mile, right? So $4 is going to take him 50 miles. If we were to share that $4 amongst those 50 miles, you're going to get $0.08 cents every mile, okay? It's going to cost you $0.08 cents every mile. So step one, find out his gas mileage. Step two, you know, obviously do that for both. Step two is to find out how much it's going to cost him per mile. Step three is really what will get us to our answer, which is um, what is the difference? How much less um, it's costing him for every mile. So if you take nine cents and subtract eight cents, that means it's one cent different after the car is fixed. All right. Um, so there you have it, kids. Let's see what's next. 36, the last one we're going to go over, it says Jada made a pot of chili with 48 ounces of ground beef. So this question was asking about pounds of ground beef. So, you know, if you want to figure out 48 ounces, you got to divide, divide it by three because there's 16, I'm sorry, divide it by three, er, divide it by 16 ounces, right, per pound, figure out that there's three pounds of beef there, all right, three, he's got three pounds of beef. All right, and he's using two tablespoons of chili to do that. But then it's really asking you about the second pot where he uses the same amount of ground beef. So again, three pounds, you'll notice that in my proportion below here. So three pounds, but he's using three times as much chili powder. You're not using three tablespoons, you're using three times the amount. So he started with two tablespoons. So two times three would be six tablespoons of ground beef. We want to figure out one tablespoon of ground, one tablespoon. Yeah, we want to figure out how much beef he's using for a pound of tablespoon. So we've got to scale that down six times, right? We've got to divide by six. So if we take six divided by six, that's going to give us one tablespoon. But we're taking three pounds, we're dividing it by six. So three pounds divided by six is going to give us a half pound for each tablespoon. So the answer to that one is five tenths of a pound or 0.5, one half, right, um, pound.